there in Psalm 100. So turn in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible around you. We are in Psalm 100, right in the middle of the Bible, the book of Psalms, finishing up this month, summer in the Psalms. Turn to Psalm 100. Actually, it's a two-part message. Last week, we, uh, it was part one from these five verses, and this and today, Lord willing, there will be part two. But let's do what we did last week. Let's just read these five verses out loud together. Another good reason to bring your Bible, because we're going to be in the Scriptures, because God wrote a book, and we want to hear him. So let's read these out loud together. Start with verse one. Ready? Go. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Is good and his faithfulness to all generations. Wow, praise God. This is the word of the Lord. Listen to God, not to me. Listen to God. This is the word of the Lord. We heard seven commands from the Lord last Sunday. Seven commands. Quick recap in case you wasn't here. Reminder if you were. We looked at seven. I'll go through them real quick, and then we'll get to our message today. Number one, we saw that the first command was to make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. That's in verse one. Make a joyful noise, all the earth. What does that mean? A loud, happy, musical sound. Not to me, not to Mark, not to Danny, not to the wall, not to the screen. It says, we gather to make a joyful noise to the Lord. He likes his praises Loud and happy. God commands all the earth to make a joyful noise to him. And last week we said that means that everybody in here, everybody, everybody in this room, everybody in East St. Louis, Cahokia, Centerville, everybody in all the world, wherever you go, is obligated to make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Then number two, we saw that the scripture calls us to serve the Lord with gladness. That's right there in verse number two. This means that we give ourselves away to the Lord. We serve the Lord with gladness. Do you realize, especially if you are a Christian, that the greatest privilege in the world is to represent the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve him because we've been served by him. Mark 10, 45 says... Jesus came not to be served. He wasn't looking for no handouts. He came to serve, and he gave his life to serve your sinful soul and my sinful soul, and we respond to his service by serving other people. Out in Cahokia, out in the school districts, this Wednesday, come out at 12 o'clock, 25th Street area, and serve the Lord with gladness. That's our privilege. But then number three, last week, We were invited, verse 2 says, come into his presence with singing. Come into his presence with singing. God is an inviting God. Every other God and every other idol of the world, study history, they come to take. They come to make you scared. They come to throw lightning bolts. God is the only God who has a big heart of hospitality, and he loves to invite you. He is the originator of the wedding and the party invitation. He wants to invite you because he's so full of joy and happiness. Like Terrence says, he wants to make your soul happy as you sing. As you sing, if you realize the secret of singing, the Lord, when you open up your mouth, he's got something to fill your soul with himself. So he says, come into my presence with singing. Then he says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Four and five. We talked about last week how the Old Testament worshiper They didn't come to their worship gathering in the Old Testament empty-handed. They always had a sacrifice. They always had a thanksgiving. They always had a praise. They knew Yahweh wasn't just good on Sunday or Saturday was the Sabbath. He was good every day. So they got up with a sacrifice and with a praise. 
how much more should we on this side of the cross come here with Jesus on our lips and thanksgiving in our hearts? It starts Saturday, Saturday night and then Sunday morning. Begin to get your heart ready. Come in here with praise. Don't wait on Danny. Don't wait on Mark. I wish they would sing that song. I wish they No, God is God. Come into his presence. We're not just coming to church. We get to come into his presence with thanksgiving and praise. And then the last two things we saw was, it says, give thanks to him and bless his name. Right? Give thanks to him. Thank you, Lord. We should be so thankful for my life, my breath, thankful for these teachers and students. Thank you, Lord. We want to bless and lift up your name. So that was last week. But this week, the question is, why? I love, I love the Lord. He gives, if you read the Bible, it's not like, well, my dad used to tell me, my grandma used to tell me, do stuff, and I'll say, why? And then, that's, that's old school right there. I ain't saying it was right now. It's like, come on, can I dialogue? Is it wrong to dialogue? And, or, or, or they would say, because I, what? Said so. Well, yeah, why? Because I told you so. That's enough. I love the Lord, though. I'm learning how to parent because the Lord doesn't just say that. The Lord doesn't just say, because I told you so. That's, that's not good parenting biblically. The Lord explains why we need to gather and bless his name. Why we need to enter his gates with thanksgiving. Why we need to sing and make a joyful noise. Seven reasons. Let's look at it from the Bible right now. Seven reasons why we ought to be joyful. Number one, because the Lord is God. The Lord is God. Look at verse three. Look at verse three. It says, know that the Lord, he is God. All right? Know that the Lord is God. Can we say that together? No, that the Lord is God. Look, you ain't got to know a lot of stuff, right? You don't have to know science. My wife's an excellent science teacher. That's good. I mean, I, I don't want my kids to use that against me, but, you know, I don't have, Daddy said I don't have to know science. Mama said, yeah, well, you, you do, but you don't ultimately have to know science. You don't ultimately have to know math or the latest fad or the latest, you know, Dance, uh, you know, you don't, you don't have to know the latest uh, 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 news. You don't have to know, you don't have to know the latest. Look, what you need to know is one thing, that the Lord is God. He says, you need to know that. Listen, when Moses, in the Old Testament, Moses was sent to overthrow the most powerful man on the planet, Pharaoh. Moses got it twisted. He thought he needed to know who was going with him. He thought he needed to know what to say. But Yahweh God told him, all you need to know to be powerfully used by me, Moses, is me. That's all you need to know, Moses. You need to know I am. That's what he said. I am that I am. You just need to know I am and everything is going to be good. Why do we praise him? All we need to know is that he's God. That's reason enough to come and praise him and worship him. Knowing that God is enough is to motivate us to say, that's a, there's a real God. And he's Yahweh Lord. And he made a covenant with his people. And 2,000 years ago, he came and he told the religious haters, guess what? I am. The guy in the Old Testament that split the Red Sea, that's me. And that's all you need to know. That should be enough to get you to praise, to know that there really is a God, and he really came, and his name is Jesus. And just for that, I'm going to praise him. But there's six more reasons. So number one, we gather and praise him and bless him because he's God. Nobody else is. But number two, we gather and worship him and praise him because the Lord made us, y'all. The Lord made us. Look at verse 3. It says, it is he who made us. The Lord made us. All human beings. Mankind. I know there's some debates. I know the evolutionary thoughts. I know all the other sciences. But the Bible says that the Lord made us. Look at Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. But let me read 
1 Corinthians 15, 47. It says this, listen. It says, Adam, somebody say Adam. Adam, Adam the first man, all right? He was the first man. So people, you know, there's stuff out there saying, is Adam first? Was it people before that? Well, God says he was the first man, okay? He's the first man, and he was made from the dust of the earth. Now, remember, this is the second reason why those seven commands from last week need to happen. Why do we gather and enter his gates with thanksgiving? Because he made you. I told my little Caleb, I asked him to go get me some dirt because I, I don't know if we really, we, we, read, we hear these stories. Look at this kid. Look at this, Jaden. It's just, that's all it is. Right, right. So, I mean, uh, thanks, Caleb, for going to get this. But, but I think we forget. The reason why we bless God is God took this and made a handsome brother like James. From this. Now, who in the, do y'all, I don't, I don't think y'all under, he took this and made a brain and organs and a system so incredible. From this, this alone deserves God to get all the glory and the praise. Whoever can make a human being out of some dirt deserves thanksgiving, praise, honor, and glory from this. And then beyond that, he took a rip. Ooh. Y'all don't know this story? And he made Karen Elizabeth. My Lord, I got to get home. Oh, It'll be a short one today. The real. Listen, why do we praise him? Because he's God. And because he's the only one that I know that can take dirt and make Chris. Well, actually, Adam was the only one that was made from the dirt. He stepped up his game, and everybody else that came to the earth after Adam and Eve First Psalm 139 that Terrence Priest says, the Lord was up in the womb knitting Tisha together and Kempton together and Isaac together and Christian together. Everybody in their mama's tummy, this is why we glorify him. So number one, he's Lord. Number two, he made us. He made us. But, but listen, we bless him and make a joyful noise because the Bible says, we are his. Am I making that up? Look at verse 3. It says, we are his. We are his people. Somebody say his. That's a beautiful, beautiful word. His. Now, now y'all got to pay attention here. It's two, different, it's two different understandings of what it means to be his. So we are his meaning we all belong to him because he created us from the dirt or in our mother's womb, right? So everybody, no matter what, if you believe in Jesus or you think he's fake, if you worship God or you're an atheist, it don't matter. He made you. You are his. But then there's a special sense in which the people that trust Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, there's a special sense in which they are his people. So everybody's his, but then there's a special group of people that have turned from their sins and call on Jesus to rescue them from hell. Those are his special people. They are his in a special way. And watch this. Can I see your eyes here? If, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you follow him, you are twice his. I got this little book I want the kids to hear for. Where, where the kids at and the kids at heart? I got this little book to help you understand what it means, follower of Christ, to be twice his. L listen, I'm, I just want to read a little bit of this. It's amazing. It's amazing. So it says, um, for weeks, check this out, for weeks, a boy worked to make a lovely little sailboat. Carefully, he carved the boat out of balls of wood, forming the bow, the stern, the hull, and the rudder. 
Then he searched through scraps of material his mother had given him until he found the perfect fabric to make the sail. When every piece was put together and the paint and glue were finally dry, the boy cut a long piece of string and tied it to the back of the boat. After school the next day, the boy hurried home. Gently, he picked up his sailboat and ran down the road to the stream that flowed through the town. Watch this. Kneeling at the edge of the creek, the boy placed his sailboat in the water, holding the end of the string tightly in his hands. He pushed the boat out toward the middle of the stream. The boat floated out, away from the bank, away from the boy. When it reached the middle of the stream, it was pulled into the fast-moving current. The boy watched with joy as the boat sailed over the rocks and past the roots of the trees. We're sailing, he cried, running alongside his homemade boat. Every day, the boy came back to the creek and sailed his boat and pulled it back to the shore and sailed his boat and pulled it back to the shore. One day, when the boy was running along the stream bank beside his homemade sailboat, the string broke. Wait, stop. Come back, little boat, he cried. But the boat just sailed on down the stream and out of his sight. Every day, the boy walked up and down the creek bank looking for his boat. He was hoping that maybe it had washed up onto the bank or perhaps had become stuck behind a rock. One day, while searching for his beloved boat, the boy went farther downstream than he ever had before. He followed the creek through a grove of pine trees and under a footbridge. Suddenly, he saw up ahead a little boy playing with a boat. When he got closer, he saw that it was his own homemade boat. The paint was chipped and the sail was torn, but still he recognized it as his own. That's mine, he shouted, running up to the other boy and reaching to grab the boat out of his hands. No, it's not. That's mine. I found it. No, it's not. I made it, but I lost it. Now give it back. Finders keepers, losers weepers, said the other boy, still holding tightly to the boat. I'll trade you. He said, what do you have? The boy reached inside his pockets and pulled out everything he had. I have some string, two battle caps, three marbles, a rubber snake, and a pocket knife. Well, said the other boy, how much of that will you give me for your sailboat? I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything I have, the boy replied. You can have it all. It's a deal, exclaimed the other boy, dropping the sailboat and reaching for the string, the bottle caps, the marbles, the rubber snake, and the pocket knife. And watch this. The boy picked up his sailboat and walked back upstream under the footbridge, through the grove of pine trees, and back to the place where he had first launched his sailboat. He said, you're twice mine. Hugging the boat tightly to his chest, he says, you're twice mine, once because I made you, and once because I bought you. If you belong to Jesus, he's saying to you this morning that he made you and you belong to him, but then when you were lost in your sin, he came and bought you. So you are twice his. That's why we worship him. That's why we praise him. Because he made us and he saved us. That's why we enter his gates with thanksgiving. Because he formed us and he forgave us. That's why we come in with praise. Because he created us and he recreated us in Christ. You're twice his. Can you say twice his? Twice his. That's why we praise this great God, but also, but also, we thank him. Number four, verse three says, because we are the sheep of his pasture. That's what it says. We are the sheep of his pasture. We are the sheep of his pasture. If you know Jesus Christ, speaking of being lost, sheep get lost. 
dumb animals. They need a shepherd. If you know Jesus, if you've heard his voice, even if you're listening to his voice, he's calling you to put your trust in him. Stop living your own life. Stop doing your own thing. He knows how to care for you more than you know how to care for you. Because remember, he made us from the dust. All right? He's our maker. You don't go to Toyota to find out how a Ford is made. You go to Ford to find out how a Ford is made. And you don't go to yourself and your friends and the world to find out how you are to function. You go to the one who created you, the one who is your shepherd. If you're following him, then you are one of his sheep. And that's why we praise him last a couple of weeks ago, because the Lord is your shepherd. And you don't have to want. And he makes you to lie down in green pastures. He leads you beside the still waters. He restores your soul. You praise him because he leads you down the path of righteousness for his namesake. You bless him because even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you fear no evil because the Lord is with you. His rod and his staff comforts you. And guess what? He prepares a table for you in the presence of all of your haters. And he anoints your head with oil. And he makes your heart overflow with joy. And he promises that goodness and mercy will follow you if you are a part of his sheep. That's why we praise him. Because he's God. Because he's our shepherd. Because we're twice his. And then we enter his gates with praise and thanksgiving. A few more. It says it's right here. I'm not making it up. We do it because the Lord is good. Can you say that with me? The Lord, the Lord is good. I know that's cliche, you know. Churches all over saying God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. God is good all the time. All the time God is good. But do you believe that when tragedy comes? Is God just good when good things happen to you? Or is he good because that's the infinite, eternal nature of his very essence? God is good, which means at least a couple things. Number one, he tastes good. It's like he tastes good. Yeah, think spiritually. The part of you that really needs to be happy, he tastes good in that place. Psalm 34, 8 says, who knows this? Say it with me. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Your soul was made for the Lord. Your mind was made for the Lord. Your spirit was made for the Lord. We gather here to worship him because we have tasted that he's better than anything that the world has to offer us. Oh, taste and see that he is good. Everything else in this world does not satisfy. It will leave you empty. All the promises of sin, all the promises of fame, all the promises of popularity, all of that, it will leave you empty. Ask Michael Jordan. He's upset because he ain't the king no more. We need to pray for him. Why do stars blow out their heads and, and, and commit suicide? Because everybody was made for the goodness of their creator, not this world, not this world. And those of us who have tasted that Jesus is better than the world, we wake up on Sunday mornings, even with tears in our eyes, even with a weak body, and we press our way to the gathering because the Lord is good. He tastes good, but he also does good. Not like you think. His good is on another whole level. Because he allows painful things to happen. Look at that cross. Now we up here celebrating. He died for me. He, that's the worst thing ever. What's wrong with you celebrating an innocent man murdered on a cross, and then you're wearing a cross. That was evil. No, but that was good. Yeah, you understand. God takes the most evil thing, like Jesus died on the cross, to make it the best thing that could ever happen. And you need to take your cues from the cross when you have suffering in your life. The cross shows us that bad stuff can really be designed as good stuff if you wait long enough for Sunday to come. 
<laughs> to raise him up from the dead, to show you that even what the enemy means for evil, he turns it for our good. One brother gives an example of a cake. How many of y'all like cake? How many of y'all like eating baking soda, though? I don't think anything. No, no hands. Everybody, raw eggs, baking soda. What else you put in the cake? Come on, bakers. Flour. How many of y'all grub? I ain't never seen y'all grubbing on no flour. <laughs> Salt. Just sugar. Just maybe sugar. You know, we, we, that's just maybe sugar. But look, look, watch this. The Lord takes all these bitter things that we wouldn't choose to eat on them, on it, you know, by themselves. He puts it together and he mixes it and he puts it in the oven and out comes this cake. That's what it means that he's working all things for good. He's taking the bitter thing that happened to you and the painful thing that happened to you and the thing over here in your family that you never would want it to happen apart from himself and he puts it together and puts you in a hot trial and you come out like pure gold. Tasting better than you did before your trial because the Lord is good. He is good. But then, why do we praise him? This last couple things and we're done. It says in verse 5, finally made it to the last, well, we, last part of the last verse. It says, his steadfast love endures forever. Did you notice you are loved? I think we need to remind each other of that more. You are loved. God's steadfast love. You know, these words, we need to just talk about them good. I just told you a little bit deeper meaning of what good really means. What about love? That's another word that needs to be redeemed. What does love mean? Look, it means, listen, God is eternally devoted to your highest and ultimate good at all times. Even if he got to spank you. I love my kids. Guess what? In love. Because I don't want to see that sinful way take them over a cliff one day. So I want to love them. The Bible says those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines them for your greatest good. Look, can I prove, you, prove to you he loves you? He gave you life. You were not a stillborn. You were not aborted. You made it here. He loves you. That's why he sustains your life, because he loves you. That's why he provides for your needs, because he loves you. That's why he surrounded you with people that are trying to reach out to you and love on you because he loves you. And ultimately, 2,000 years ago, he gave you his son and slaughtered him so that you can see a bloody cross and forever know I'm loved by God. He took nails in his hands to scream to you, I love you. A crown of thorns pressed into his cranium, bleeding in his eyeballs to prove to you, I love you. They took nails and drove them into his feet to scream to you, I love you. And then nobody could ever understand the Mount Everest of sin that we all committed, all history, present, past, future. He took all of our sin, put it up on a mountain and lifted it up and dumped it on his son. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the answer is because I love them. And I've said this before. Let me see your eyes. Jesus is the only one that can take your face and look you in the eyes and say, I love you to death because he really did die. You are more loved than you could ever imagine. And when you experience the love of Jesus, you enter his gates with thanksgiving. You enter his courts with praise. You make a joyful noise to him. When you know you're twice his, you come into his presence 
with singing. See, these are reasons. Don't forget, these are reasons upon reasons why the Lord is motivating your heart to prize the corporate gathering. It's not an option. It's not, it's not oh, I might gather with God's people. It's such a privilege, especially when you know that the Lord is good. And finally, finally, that last verse says, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. I'm here to tell East St. Louis and the fatherless that have been destroyed by the faithlessness of many fathers, the single mom, you a hero. Lord bless you, single moms in the house. We all been cut by the sharp pieces of unfaithful men and even women. We know what it's like for people to break their promise. You're supposed to love me, mama. You're supposed to love me, daddy. But listen, right in the midst of that, God stands and says, I'm your faithful father. You will not find a father. I don't care if you have both your parents and you love your dad. You will not find a more faithful father than the living God of the universe. He is faithful to his promise. This means that our good, good father will always do the good and loving things that he promised to do. Look, where your Bible at? Can you hold your Bible? Grab a Bible somewhere. Lift it up. Lift it up, please. Just lift it up. Lift it up. Look, 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 look. This book is full of promises for you if you'll read it. Now, if you don't have a Bible, take one of the white ones and read it. You can put them down. This is, this is a love letter from your father. Hundreds of promises. And, and 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 120 says that all God's promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Now, what does that mean? I used to always say, y'all quoting that. What in the world does that mean? It's real simple. It means that if you belong to Jesus, all God's promises belong to you because Jesus purchased them for his people. I want to just close and give you a few of them. Child of God, God has promised you his forgiveness, 1 John 1, 9. Be cleansed. Be forgiven. Child of God, God has promised you his spirit. Luke eleven thirteen, 13, living on the inside of you. Receive that. Child of God, God has promised you his power to witness in Acts 1, 8. Child of God, God has promised you his wisdom when you don't know what to do in James 1, 5. Child of God, God has promised you his peace when the storm is raging, Philippians 4, 7. Child of God, God has promised you his joy when everything else around you is full of sorrow, John 16, 24. And finally, child of God, this is the greatest one, God has promised you his presence. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So rise up in the morning, and I'm done. And open up this book. Not Facebook, this book. And find you a promise to live on. Because I guarantee you, your fragile, shaky faith needs to be fed a promise. And oh, it'll strengthen your heart all day long. This is why we praise you. This is why we gather. And so, because the Lord is God, because the Lord made us, because we are his, some of us are twice his, because we are the sheep of his pasture, because the Lord is good, because his love never fails, his faithfulness is forever. That's why we make a joyful noise to the Lord. That's why we serve him with gladness. That's why we come before his presence with singing. That's why we enter his gates with thanksgiving. That's why we enter his courts with praise. That's why we give thanks to him and bless his name every day and every Sunday and forever and ever because he's a good, good father. We are loved by him. Would you bow your heads as Danny comes up to lead us in worship. If you don't know this father, and there's somebody in here that doesn't know this father. There's somebody in here who's not a sheep. 
that's following Jesus. Guess what? The promises in the Bible are not for you. But all of that can change today if you will listen to Jesus speaking to you saying, come to me. I made you. You're once mine, but if you let me give you a new heart, you'll be twice mine and every promise will be yours. So just call on the name of Jesus. Just say in your heart, Lord, I, I trust you. I want to follow you. I don't want to play games. I want to enter your gate. I want to enter your presence. I want to serve you with gladness, Lord, but I don't know you. And, and, and one thing I need to know is Jesus, you're God. And today I give you my life. So, Lord, give new life in here today strengthen your people today oh God make us a Psalm 100 church please Lord make us a Psalm 100 